My name is Betsy Gare. I'm the Executive Director of the Connecticut Council of Small Towns, and I'm here to welcome you today. Um, we have a great program for you today. Um, I just want to say a little about cost. We are a grassroots advocacy organization. We represent small towns, and our primary mission is to give small towns a big voice at the state capitol to make sure that when they consider issues, budget issues, unfunded mandates, changes in laws and regulations, that they consider the impact on our small towns. And as you know, we are facing very significant challenges in Connecticut, so it's more important than ever that you um, are members of our organization and are active in our organization, so we appreciate that. I do now want to um, first thank our sponsors, Eversource, for both hosting and sponsoring the event, Camoyne Associates, and Pullman and Comley. So we're very pleased to have their sponsorship. It allows us to provide this program for you at a minimal cost. I'm Jack Arcego. I'm the manager of uh, community relations here in Connecticut, along with our uh, community relations specialist in the back, Pat Bands. Would you raise your hand? Thank you, Pat, for helping to put all this together today. And community relations uh, is a big supporter of economic development. Uh, Eversource is as well. Our group is the primary contact for all our municipalities, as you know. And part of that uh, the, uh, relationship building is around economic development and uh, promoting our state, keeping businesses that we have, promoting businesses uh, that want to come in here as well. Uh, so we're very happy to be able to uh, be here and sponsor this this morning. I'd like to introduce uh, one of our key sponsors and our next presenter, Robert Camoyne from CEO, President and CEO of Camoyne Associates. Thanks and uh, good morning. Uh, great to be here with you this morning. Uh, we had an opportunity to talk very quickly about Camoyne Associates, but I thought instead of doing that, what I would prefer to do is uh, maybe just share with you why we think uh, economic development is so vital and important. Um, as you may or may not know, I uh, just heard a, or saw a stat the other day, Connecticut um, over the last two decades has the exact same number of jobs today as it did 20 years ago. And of course, uh, you, you're all very familiar with some of the financial ramifications of that. Um, there are social implications uh, of an economy that's you know, stagnant or not growing, and, and Connecticut's not alone. Um, I live part-time in Connecticut, part-time in New York, we're experiencing some of the same things there, particularly in upstate. But there are social implications. Lower wages relative to other areas of the country. Our kids are leaving other areas, to, you know, to, to move to other areas where there are job op meaningful job opportunities. Less funding for education and infrastructure, and you can see it, I'm sure, in, in some of your communities. That's sort of the social reality of, um, uh, you know, again, a stagnant or underperforming economy relative to others. Uh, but, there, but it's also very personal, and economic development has come under fire for the last five years. Uh, you know, those on the outside think that what we do is steal companies from each other, and, and the reality is that's, 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 that's not true. Um, but, it's, but economic development, I think, is personal, and, I, and what I mean by that is, and, and I, the only way I can I best describe it, I guess, is by uh, sharing a story that uh, with you and I have probably five of these stories over over my career in economic development and uh, as a kid getting off the bus in high school um, living in a neighborhood where most of the people were employed by IBM my father was uh, employed by IBM the parkers across the street were not um, he worked in a, in a printing press manufacturing equipment manufacturer in Poughkeepsie and one day getting off the bus um, Mr. Parker is sitting out on his step, very friendly, always a very friendly dad in the neighborhood. I go over and chat with him and um, he's got a cup of coffee in his hand and he tells me he had just lost his job that morning. 16, 17 years old, that really didn't mean all that much to me, but as days turned into months getting off the bus, that, that coffee turned into a beer. Um, eight months later, the conversation with him is slurred. Um, and then, you know, you start to realize that the family dynamics are changing. There's, you know, loud arguing in the house. Well, uh, coming year, uh, the, some neighbors uh, were able to help him secure a job with IBM in a clean room, and the dynamics of the family changed like that. Um, um, you know, what, what turned into a probably deep concern about their family financial future turned into discussions about their daughter going to college, turned into, um, you know, hearing Mr. Parker go off to work, uh, didn't have to start, restart, a, a continually stalling 
pickup truck before it even got out of the driveway, you know, replaced with a new car. Um, and what was once a very bubbly personality, which had been clearly very depressed, tur turned uh, like that. And that's what economic development, I think, is at the personal, at a personal level. It's, it's why at Camoyne we do what we do. We're trying to help communities um, um, Im improve their competitiveness, become, you know, competitive locations for meaningful job creation. And I think it's why you do what you do and why what you're doing is, is so important. So education uh, is, is very important. I'm involved uh, with, through IEDC, um, through uh, a lot of their education and training. And uh, as is Mark, <clears throat> you've got some great, couple of great speakers today. After today, do what you can to keep honing your skills because it is important. You're on the, you're on the ground at the forefront of um, making these sort of societal and I think personal uh, changes in the lives of people. So enjoy the day. Thanks. If I asked you how long have there been people doing something called or at least seeming to be like economic development, what would your answer be? Is this a relatively new phenomenon? Yeah, it's been going on for a long, long time. Some uh, uh, simple examples uh, out of various textbooks and economic development uh, uh, periodicals. One was about a village in France. It was back in the 1600s. The village in France had a blacksmith. Blacksmith died. Village next door had two blacksmiths. What do you think happened? You know, village A went to village B and tried to recruit one of the blacksmiths uh, to move. Very similar to what communities are doing these days. Then I've heard the same story attributed to both Benjamin Franklin and Alexander Hamilton, which proves that either it was a common occurrence or the story is completely bogus. Uh, uh, but one or both of these gentlemen were thinking about establishing a business somewhere in the vicinity of Philadelphia, and the people from the Jersey New Jersey side of the river came and said, would you think about going to our side of the river, not just the Pennsylvania side of the river? That was in the 1700s. Arguably, Abraham Lincoln could be called a godfather of economic development. What did Abe Lincoln do that might earn him that title? Emancipation Pardon me? Emancipation Proclamation. Uh, Proclamation, Emancipation Proclamation part of it, but not the answer I'm looking for. See, if we had somebody in this room who worked for a railroad, they would be going, ooh, 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 uh, because Abraham Lincoln signed the Railroad Land Grant Acts of 1862 and 1864, which said what to the railroads? Build railroads. Build railroads. Go out into the wilderness. Extend your rail lines. The railroads, not being dummies, created what were called departments of immigration which existed to encourage people to get on those trains, move out into the wilderness, establish new communities, and use the railroads, by the way, to move their beans, bullets, and boards out there so that they would have a, a successful, successful uh, community. About the same time, the electric utilities started to get into uh, the development game because they had the same sort of, of uh, opportunity as the railroads had. Uh, so we have uh, electric company economic development uh, departments. And then in the late 1800s, early 1900s, the Chamber of Commerce movement uh, uh, caught fire. Now, Chambers of Commerce go back several hundred years around the world. Uh, but in the United States, in the 1890s, uh, 1910s, Chambers really became powerful and important uh, what would have been going on that would lead to the chambers uh, taking over that role? Pardon me? Industry, growth, and in particular, this was back in the days when we had no growth management planning. We had no zoning regulations. So industries did what? They plunked down wherever they wanted to plunk down and, and uh, built their facilities. That began to lead to communities that were not particularly attractive or desirable, and so communities started to bring in growth management regulations, which led the businesses to band together in the chambers of commerce, so that instead of having lots of individual small squeaky voices, they had a big loud voice in terms of a chamber business community interacting with the, with the uh, municipal uh, officials. So lots of history leading up to where we are today. 
I'm going to talk about four Ds. First time I ever used a slide similar to this, I, I didn't have the ID and the ED. And C. I just had four Ds, and I said, does anybody have any idea what I'm talking about when I talk about the four Ds? And like you, there was silence <laughs> until a voice in the back said, your college grades? So no, this is not what we're talking about. We are talking about four forms of, what's the D stand for? Development that are somewhat different, somewhat interrelated, uh, you know, sometimes almost synonymous, but with different names. And we're briefly going to explore all four. When I started in the business, I was in the ID business which uh, stood for what? Industrial development. I went to work for a brand new department of community development that had taken over, this was in Milford, Connecticut, my, my hometown, had taken over the function of Milford's Industrial Development Commission, because that's what we used to call these things. We didn't call them economic development. Why the emphasis on industrial? What did the term industrial development mean? Job manufacturing. It was the recruitment of manufacturing firms because the concept was the more manufacturing firms we could bring in, the more jobs we would create, the more wages we would have, the more money that would be circulating uh, in, in the community. Any of you uh, taken any economics courses that you want to admit? You ever hear the term either uh, economic base theory or export base theory? The two terms are used synonymously. Basically, what it says is our goal uh, as a successful economy is to make something or do something here, but sell it over there so that they send their money to us into our community, and that expands our economy. Uh, the exports uh, are what supposedly grow your economy, but if you're merely recirculating your money in the economy, it doesn't grow it. Another related concept is you have uh, good money, neutral money, and bad money. Good money is money coming in. Neutral money is money that's circulating in, in your area from homeowner to grocery store to gas station to doctor, to, but it doesn't add to the economic pie. What's bad money? Money going out, what in the retail trade we call retail leakage. It's you know, people who have money they could spend in our community, but they're spending it somewhere else, and what is causing that to happen more and more today? Internet sales. We can order stuff from anywhere. You know, I just bought a pair of black jeans from L.L. Bean up in Freeport, Maine. So my money went from Connecticut to Freeport, Maine, uh, where it hires people and, and uh, they spend it up in Freeport. Then we, in the mid-70s, started transitioning into the concept of economic development. The American Economic Development Council, which is now part of the International Economic Development Council as a, a result of a merger about 15 years ago, uh, wrote a publication uh, that included this definition of economic development. It is the process of creating wealth. That doesn't mean making individuals rich. That means growing the economy uh, by mobilizing all of the resources that you've got in your community so that somebody can sell something. You're generating marketable goods and services. What's the difference between that definition and what we looked at for industrial development? It added the term and services. Okay? Wait, you, uh, are any of you familiar with NAICS codes, N-A-I-C-S? The North American Industrial Classification System. That replaced what was called the SIC code system, Standard Industrial Classification System. Two primary differences in that transition. When we went from SIC to NAICS, we went to United States specific to North American, and we went from industry, manufacturing specific, to manufacturing and services, uh, distribution, and all other kinds of uh, economic activity uh, that, are, that are going up. What's a common definition of economic development? Three words in the middle word is and. How about jobs and taxes? Okay. When communities invest 
in economic development. They're generally interested in uh, more jobs, better paying jobs, jobs with better benefits, jobs that are closer to home so you don't have to spend as much money as you do on commuting costs, those sorts of things. And then for us it, around here where we're particularly dependent on property taxes, real estate property taxes, sometimes personal property taxes, uh, uh, the more stuff we have out there that's taxable, the more tax revenue uh, that we have. The corollary to that definition of economic development is what does an economic developer do? And it is to influence that process of creating wealth for the benefit of the locality, the community, uh, uh, to expand job opportunities and generate tax revenues, capital investment or other things that uh, translate into tax revenues. That for most of us will explain uh, our motivation for doing uh, economic development. There have been changes over time. We used to use the mnemonic business acre. I'll show you what these stand for. That's been replaced by react, which I don't like, but uh, you know, react was, you know, wh what other words can you get with those five letters? Trace and so anyway. Uh, there have been changes in targets. There have been changes in responsibilities of economic developers. Here's what those two mnemonics stand for. When it was Acre, it was attraction and creation, business attraction, business creation, that's getting something new that you didn't used to have, or retention and expansion, that's hanging on to what you've already got and hopefully having it grow. Four primary responsibilities in economic development, but we've added a fifth one. That's the aspect of business transition because uh, any of you live any place where you have exactly the same uh, businesses as you had 20 years ago and they're doing exactly the same thing they did 20 years ago? Of course not. Businesses change over time and one of the things that economic developers can do is help those businesses uh, do uh, what, what they're, they're trying to do. And that may even be uh, moving out of the community uh, to, to uh, uh, go to someplace more productive. Now, one of the, one of the things that you see uh, up up in uh, Enfield, that's where uh, Lego is, right? Enfield uh, is that they lost a major manufacturing plant. It moved to Mexico. They now have a higher payroll with Lego in there because those manufacturing jobs have been replaced by fewer number but better paying executive level uh, jobs up there. So that's an important transition that uh, you may insert yourself into and help uh, with. Changes in targets. We're at the point where we're going to do the first exercise to get you uh, participating a little more. Let us make a list of targets that your economic development program is after and I will prime the pump by saying Basic manufacturing, this is what it means by thinking about forms of operation, not, you know, we could say plastic injection molding for automotive, uh, you know, I don't want to get to that level of detail. Basic manufacturing, what other kinds of targets might you be after? Yep. Uh, retail. Retail is one where we've got to be careful because that could be uh, the, the neutral money could just be taking uh, your dollars, your disposable income that your residents have and spending it in a, in a store that keeps the money in there. But it could be a major uh, company that is bringing in people from 70 mile uh, radius. Bass Pro Shops typically looks at a 70 mile radius uh, as a draw. They come into town, they spend money, some of that money stays there. Yes, sir? Corporate services. Corporate services. services. Yep. Okay. Services has two parts of it. Business services or the corporate services that he mentioned and personal services, doctors and those, those kinds of things. You know, we talk about uh, all the time uh, how we have a, a uh, trade gap where we're importing more than we're exporting in the United States. Business services is one of the areas where we export more uh, than we import. It is a major uh, growth sector for the United States. What else? Information technology. IT, information technology. 
a very important, rapidly growing one that can be a business service. Recreation. recreation. Not all recreation is free. And even if it is free, it could be an important quality of life factor that supports bringing more people into your community which, who then spend more in your stores uh, and, and so on. Anything else you're after? Yeah. Research. Research. And development, R&D. OK, you get the idea. I will show you the list that most frequently comes up. The, the important part here is that not every community is equally suitable for certain forms of uh, operations. And not every operation is equally suitable for your communities. So you can see, uh, we didn't mention education, but educational institutions can be important. Agriculture, agribusiness can be very important. Government facilities. Uh, we, we didn't specifically mention offices, but offices cut across a wide variety of different applications. And when you see the term back office, what does that mean? What's a back office? Could be internal business support services, definitely. Or it can be any form of operation where the people providing those services don't have to face to face interact with the people who need the services. And that might be internal to the company. But it could also be uh, one of my uh, favorite projects I worked on was in Barbados, where the largest employer was a 1,200 worker uh, uh, information processing operation. Uh, if you happened at that point in time when I was working there to have a problem with your American Airlines frequent flyer uh, uh, program, you called an 800 number and somebody in Bridgetown, Barbados uh, answered the phone. Uh, they were so successful doing that that at one point in time they also were doing uh, information services for three of the Hartford located insurance companies. But, but their, uh, their call center a form of uh, back office, was in Bridgetown, Barbados. That's one of the examples of how you're not just competing with your next door neighbor community. You're competing with other states, other regions, other countries, uh, and, and it's a fierce competition. Now, primary responsibilities used to be largely marketing. When I was an industrial developer, or then we changed to uh, economic development, Primarily what I did was spend time marketing my community to companies somewhere to try and convince them to come to Milford, Connecticut, and then Stratford, Connecticut when I, when I moved over there, and, and set up operations there that then over time would hopefully uh, grow. We started adding more responsibilities. This is not substitution, it's additive. So in the uh, 1980s, Economic developers became concerned with growth management because that defines the product that we're selling. What's your, what's your product in, in the economic development marketplace? What are you selling? You're selling your place. You're selling your community or your county or your region. Uh, so, and I'll come back to that uh, uh, concept a couple of more uh, times. In the 1990s, we added environmental management because that also helps define what it is we're selling. Uh, if you've got a dirty, smoky, smelly uh, community with uh, problems with its water quality and air quality, you don't have a particularly desirable product to market for economic development. And currently, we've added relationship management and technology management to the things that economic developers, and I'm using that term not just to refer to full-time or part-time staff, but it also refers to boards and commissions, economic development commissions, or councils, uh, or, or uh, regional groups. You know, anybody that is spending time trying to grow their economy is uh, an economic developer to a certain extent. Why is your community investing in economic development? We've already named the top two, which were jobs and taxes. And we add to that uh, conveniently available goods and services so that people don't have to get in their car and drive 50 miles to go to the doctor or get a jug of milk 
or a loaf of bread. You know, we, we want to be able to make things convenient. And then there can be a whole slew of other community motivations, other community improvements uh, that you want to get done, and economic development is the tool uh, that, you, that you use to do that. You may have a uh, historical downtown or neighborhood that is uh, now uh, a little rough around the edges, and fixing it up is uh, one of the things you would like to do. Economic development is one of the routes uh, that we can uh, take to, to do that. Then we're on to the uh, third D. When, when I say we are sitting here today in the community of uh, Berlin, actually I'm not, there's a, there's a town line sign right out there by the, by, the, by the entrance road. And when we use the term community that way, how are we using it? Talking about a place, right? A place that's got a name, you can find it on a map. It might have legal definition of what the boundaries are. Geographic term. If you look at the word community up in the dictionary, you will find that at least half of the definitions say something along the lines of a community is all of the people living in a location, sharing wants, needs, goals, objectives, problems, uh, whatever. If we picked up Newington, Connecticut, or Berlin, Connecticut, and moved it lock, stock, and pussycat out into the middle of Iowa, we would have some differences, a little flatter, a lot more corn, but it'd be pretty much the same community because the people create the community. So community is both a geographic term and a social term. How about development? The mayor announced the development of a new 150-acre industrial park. How am I using the term development? Creating something that we didn't used to have, right? Building something, adding something, growth, change, scary part. I suggest to you that development can also be the opposite. Now, I said I was the community development director in Milford, Connecticut. Any of you ever go to Milford's Oyster Festival? No. Milford has got a uh, oyster industry. There's a national shellfish laboratory uh, there. And I was sitting around uh, one day with the uh, director of the Chamber of Commerce and some other people on the chamber board. And, and we said, our merchants downtown are dying in the hot summer months because half the population is away on vacation and the other half of the population is going to the beach and nobody's going shopping. What can we do to bring people into downtown Milford at least for a weekend? Let's create an oyster festival. We did. First year oyster festival, estimated attendance five to 7,000. Not bad for a uh, event right out of the box. Second year, 10, 12,000. Third year, 13 to 15,000. Nice growth. Seventh year of the oyster festival, estimated attendance in Milford, whose population was 50,000 and change, was somewhere around 70,000 people. We had Winnebago's from Montana that uh, put the Milford Oyster Festival on their list of places to go on their summer swoop to New England. Went into the merchants and said, so, how's the event working for you? Anybody coming in? Yeah, primarily shoplifters. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, you know, the idea of the Oyster Festival was you were going to walk around eating your oysters and drinking a beer and listening to the bands and shopping at the, the uh, crafts vendors. You, know, you could walk around, but you couldn't get your arm up because there's too many people getting in the way of your beer. Now, the conscious decision was made to stop advertising the Oyster Festival outside of the state of Connecticut. The attendance at the Oyster Festival was reduced down to about 25 to 30,000. It's now back up, last I saw it, at 40,000 or, or somewhat larger, so it's continuing uh, to grow. But the point is that act of diminishment, that act of getting smaller, was an important development for the Oyster Festival and Milford's tourism program. So I suggest to you that don't think of development as automatically always being growth getting bigger. Think of it more as being change, which could be bigger, could be smaller, could just be different. So a very simple definition of community development is uh, any change that impacts the people living in some location. That's a goofy definition. The more important part is the red line, which is to recognize that you and every decision you make 
project you support, idea you float, are being an agent of change. Are all of your residents equally enamored of changes in their community? No. No. So that paints a big old bullseye on your back uh, when you are an economic developer or economic development board and commission member who are uh, uh, supporting something that is going to change the character of the community noticeably. Most communities, in my estimation, are schizophrenic when it comes to economic development. They all say they want it as long as they don't have to see it. Okay? And you know, that, that can be, become a problem. An economic development definition of community development is the things that we do to make our location, our product, more competitive uh, so that we can attract more investment by companies, whether they're going to be new to the area or whether they're in your community and you want them to expand in the area, if they're going to uh, invest in uh, you know, capital investments or job creation or whatever, that can be a good thing for your community. Some interrelationships between some, some uh, uh, forms of development. You see a big circle, that's community development. Then you see the three circles in the middle. The social development, physical development, economic development, and in the middle where they all intersect, ID industrial development. This is from a publication called Principles of Total Community Development that came out in the 1970s. What's the difference between the two? The old model and the current model. The drawing is exactly the same. The difference is the interpretation of it. In the old days, if we said Look at community development and industrial development. Which one drives the other one? What would the answer have been? Industrial development drives community development. If you don't have enough manufacturing, you have an unhealthy community. Is that how we would uh, uh, explain it today? Exactly the opposite. If you don't have a healthy community, you have limited chance of getting the limited number of industrial development locations or growth uh, that uh, can, can occur in a community. So we've had a 180 degree flip-flop in how we interpret this, uh, this diagram. On to the fourth day, sustainable development, as defined by the Brundtland Commission, which was the United Nations Commission on Sustainable Development, that changed its name to, yeah, they couldn't stay simple, right? The United Nations High Level Political Forum on Sustainable Development. Yay. It's a definition that goes back to the uh, 1980s, which says that, uh, uh, I'm going to paraphrase, sustainable development is doing things now that meet our own needs and goals uh, uh, in a way that doesn't screw up our kids and our grandkids' ability to do things they wanted to have done when they get to that point in time. What are the, what's the challenge in that definition? You don't know what the future is. It requires a long-term mentality. For most Americans, long-term means three weeks. Okay. We ain't talking that. We're talking the Iroquois concept of, of the uh, principle of seven generations. In our every deliberation, we must consider the impact on the next seven generations. Any of you uh, use a product by a company called seventh generation? Environmentally clean, sensitive, cleaning products, and those sorts of things. They're headquartered up in, in uh, Burlington, Vermont. And they take their, their name and their philosophy from that Iroquois concept of long-term uh, uh, mentality about our earth. They have a corollary saying. It is, we do not inherit the earth from our parents. We borrow it from our children. We do not inherit the earth from our parents. We borrow it from our children. That has always struck me as being particularly meaningful and in part of your economic development responsibilities, you sort of need to keep reminding yourself that not every project is a project that will make sense in your community. Now, I had a, a, a client, there's a region actually, down in South Carolina 
that was fighting to get the nuclear waste processing facility. Would any of our communities be interested in, in getting that around here? No, but for them down there who had a long history of nuclear operations, it didn't bother them at all. So there are certain kinds of projects that you need to be willing to say, sorry, but you don't fit in our community. Economic developers are like Pavlov's dog. You know, you remember Pavlov's dog? Taught him you ring the bell and g gave him some food pretty soon and he'd start to drool. So you'd ring the bell pretty soon and you didn't have to bring out the food. Just ring the bell and he'd start to drool. Economic developers do that about the word project. There's a potential project. Oh, uh, I want it. You, know, you can't want everything. This is the uh, uh, current explanation of sustainable development from that uh, very long name to uh, United Nations. But you see, part of it is good jobs and economic growth. Part of it is infrastructure. Uh, part of it is education. Uh, all of the things that we get into that we are concerned about as both a precursor for getting economic development or a result from getting economic development. So there's lots of good things there. You can go to this website and, and read a lot more on, on what all of these things mean. Things that economic developers need to know in order to do their jobs. Uh, it is highly interdisciplinary. We're going to talk about that uh, in a minute. Rapidly changing. We're constantly getting new tools, uh, hearing new terms, uh, and it requires you to uh, wear lots of hats. And if you're going to stay in the economic development realm for any uh, time, there's a, uh, a continuing education requirement. Uh, Rob alluded to it. If you want to continue your economic development education, there's a series of about 25 loosely called basic economic development courses. They're four days, give or take, different places structure their days uh, differently. And they get into lots of detail about many of the concepts that we're just barely touching on uh, today. Rob is the course director for the New York program. I'm the course director for the New England program. Uh, there's others around the country and one even in Mexico that share the same curriculum use the same manual, and if you're interested in learning more, uh, yeah, that is a, a good place to go. Uh, Sadie Colcord, who's sitting over here, uh, was in our most recent one last, uh, uh, last August. And uh, if you want to find out some more about what's going on in them, uh, uh, you can go talk to Sadie about it. Disciplines we need to know about. If we had more time, I wouldn't show you this slide yet. I would go around the room and I would say, what you study in school and how do you use it in economic development? And I've never encountered anyone that said, I studied this and it's totally irrelevant to economic development. This is probably the most highly interdisciplinary field uh, that uh, uh, we can get into. Now, I, I have understanding people up there because my original undergraduate education was training to be a child clinical psychologist. Okay. I was going to spend my professional career working with messed up kids. Yeah. Okay. Went into the Marine Corps, got out, got, went to work for the city of Milford. Uh, I spent eight years in municipal government work uh, with a board of aldermen and a town council. Never met a bigger bunch of screwed up kids. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so the whole aspect of understanding people is very important to what we do because we are in a people business. We are constantly interacting with all kinds of different people. And you see all of the rest of the disciplines that we need to know something about. And if you're not an expert or don't have a relatively decent level of expertise in some of these fields, then you need to have somebody in your resource base that does know about those. So that when the question comes up about uh, electric utilities, you can go to somebody that you know at uh, Eversource. Or when something comes up about telecommunications, you can go to someone who works from the major, for one of the major telecommunications firms and find out, what does this term mean? Or when my client tells me that they need this, you know, what do I have to do to deliver it? Do we have it even? Uh, so, so this is not 
what some of your parents may have told you when you were growing up, you know, it's not who you know, it's what you know. In our business, it's both. It's both what you know, but it's also the who you know as part of your resource base to deal with the uh, uh, questions. Uh, you, you know, any of you educators by trade? Yeah. So you will have a much better feel for educational system and how it works than most of the other people in this room. So you need to have linkages with your school officials uh, to help you with those sorts of things. What we need to know why and how businesses go about looking for new locations. It's another exercise. What are some of the reasons that you have encountered where either your existing businesses or prospect businesses are uh, considering a new location? Pardon me? Can't hear you. Okay, so they're looking for a place with a better tax base. So it might have something to do with taxes in a variety of different functions, because better tax base in their mind translates into lower tax rate, uh, which is you know, probably what they're really looking for. Expansion. They need to expand. Talent, Talent workers, labor skills. Okay, so I'll, I'll do a big one, infrastructure, which is transportation, utilities, and telecommunications, all parts of infrastructure. Demographics, which can cut across lots of things. Demographics are particularly important to some retail uh, establishments because they're looking at how many people do you have and what do they have for disposable income and what are their age groups and those sorts of things. Education, sure. Education is important in two ways. For starters, it tells us what we're going to get for the future workforce, workforce skills. And if you've got people moving with that company into your community and they've got school age kids, they're going to be very concerned about education for their kids as a quality of life factor. Land, real estate. Because it may not be land, greenfield, it might be move into existing building. We'll look at that momentarily. Market, Market access. Yep. Place. Waste. Place. Oh, place. What I would call quality of life factors or quality of place factors. Yep. Yep. So you get the idea uh, because we are cramped for time. Permitting, yeah, absolutely. What we put into a category called business climate. Okay? How welcoming are your regulations and your procedures, or conversely, how onerous? Here, here are uh, the, the most common things. A lot of it has to do with space, either need more space, and if it's a technology company, they may need more space very quickly because they get a patent and suddenly they've got customers coming out of their ears. They may need less space. Is that necessarily an indication of a company on the verge of uh, going bankrupt? No. They may be uh, going to leaner manufacturing, uh, adopting automation, requiring less space for fewer people. Might be different space because that new equipment may need to go higher than the ceiling, uh, the clear height uh, that they currently uh, have. They may be looking to do a branch plant. They're not moving from somewhere. They're just establishing a new location. Or they may be looking to move. So that's a possibility. Uh, they may be currently leasing and want to own, or vice versa. Uh, the, the motivation's there. Uh, the workforce we talked about. What we didn't mention was uh, that they might be fleeing a union or prefer a right to work state location. Now, I think it's something like 33 states are right to work states, and there's a, a couple of more on the horizon. Do you all understand what the right to work concept means? Do I need to explain that for anybody? Basically, if you're in a right to work state, even though you, the company that you're going to work for is unionized, you don't have to join the union and pay union dues in order to work for that company. 
In non-right-to-work states, if it's a unionized company, generally you have to be a member of the union uh, in order to work there, unless you happen to have one of the exempt jobs uh, that uh, don't come under the union purview. Uh, reducing operating costs. When we talk about operating costs, we need to look at everything. Labor costs, utility costs, tax costs, transportation costs, uh, all of them added together. Sometimes when a company is making a location, they don't choose the location from which they can sell the most or which has the absolute lowest operating cost. They choose the location where sales less operating costs gener generates the best bottom line. Uh, and that could be a location that is neither most sales or, or lowest, lowest costs. So you need to look at all of the, all of the costs. Uh, could be merger and acquisition. You know, company gets uh, bought and uh, suddenly a facility in your location is uh, no longer needed. The business climate that uh, Mike raised, your, your development regulations, your zoning and your land use regulations, could be a quality of life uh, motivation, uh, the, the place issues that you brought up. So lots of different reasons why businesses look for a new location. They typically do that in a two-phase process. First phase is a process of elimination. There are a ton of places with e economic development programs. Uh, companies don't want to look at all of them. They want to whittle the list down to a small handful that they then do phase two detailed process of comparison that uh, generates the, the winning location. This is a different explanation of the same process. This came from my friend Mark Sweeney of McCallum Sweeney, one of the major site location firms. Now, they look like they've got four phases, right? It says planning and then three other phases. But if you draw a line right up through the middle, right here, Planning phase, phase one, that's my process of elimination at the end of which we got those candidate communities, the finalists. And then on this side is the process of comparison where we're uh, evaluating them in terms of a, a set list of evaluation criteria. Now, I already made the uh, argument that your community is what you're selling and there's so many of them that your community has the value of dirt, not the value of diamonds, contrary to what your Chamber of Commerce uh, uh, will, will tell you. Because there's over 35,000 places just in the United States, not all of them going after economic development, but a lot of them uh, that, that are trying to get relatively limited number of larger projects. There's certainly a whole bunch more smaller projects, but it, it's a, a highly, fiercely competitive uh, uh, business. Some competitive realities. Any of you see uh, the publication, Conway Publications, Site Selection Magazine? Every spring, they come up with their annual uh, scorecard of project locations broken down by state. And this is what has happened over the uh, 17 years that I've been, I've been tracking it. What do you see? Down, 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 down. Oops, came back up a couple of years, and then it's come back down again a little bit. It's so kind of bouncing around. The bottom line here is that the level of activity in 2016 was only 45% of what it was in the year 2000. This includes manufacturing firms, office locations, research and development uh, locations, warehouse distribution locations or some facility that mixes some of those uh, things that are any of three criteria. Million dollars or more in capital investment. Well, that doesn't buy a whole lot anymore. You know, that's a relatively small building. Or 50 or more jobs. Or 20,000 square feet or more. That can be a new building or it can be an addition to an existing building. So. You might think there should be way more locations nationwide uh, than, than uh, what, we're, what we're seeing here. So 5,500, 5,600. For Connecticut, and I know not all of you are from Connecticut, same years. We average about 24 projects a year. 
that meet the, any of those three criteria. You know, it wasn't all three. That was any of those uh, three. You know, are we getting our fair share of activity that is going on nation, nationwide? My read is no. My read is in part, it's the issue that Mike raised, which was the development climate, the rules and regulations that uh, we make companies adhere to in order to award them a location in our community. I'll show you some examples uh, of what your competition is doing that will make you cry. We are in an era of a global jobs auction. Companies got jobs to create somewhere, and they basically auction them off to the highest bidder. Okay. Gets us into what? Being able to offer incentives, putting on your Monty Hall hat and playing let's make a deal for those of you who remember that old uh, 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 program. Already made the argument that uh, uh, you are a commodity your communities are commodities. This is a buyer's market. There are way fewer buyers than there are sellers, communities out there. And it is now a just-in-time uh, process. Here's an example of just-in-time. Speed is of the absolute essence. The time frame that companies now allow from the day they make the decision they need a new location to the day they go into that uh, location is uh, half of what it was 20 years ago. Uh, it's now actually down to six to eight weeks to pick the, the winning community and another six to eight weeks to uh, come up with the real estate, whether it's a plot of land to build on or a building uh, to move into. So you've got 12 to 16 weeks. You've got three to four months. Uh, so when the phone rings on a Thursday and a site location consultant or a business executive says, I'm going to send you a questionnaire, a request for information, ROI, and I need it back next Tuesday, and it's 25 pages long of information that you have no clue uh, you know, how, how to get it. It's not because they've waited to the last minute and been lazy. It's because they got you know, three to four months to get through this process. That's what the situation now demands. That's the reality. Current keys to competitiveness, we've talked about uh, most of them. Number one for most companies is labor. Can I get enough uh, workers with the skills that I need at reasonable costs? Number two is real estate, rapidly available uh, place to uh, set up operations. Number three is your ability to produce customizable information about your region. One of the realities here is that companies don't start out looking at individual communities. They start out looking at a region. If they like what they see in the region, then they may come to see you in your locality to find out more about your, your community. Uh, I already talked about let's make a deal. You, you ought to have some incentive tool in your toolbox. Uh, uh, the, there was a survey done a number of years ago. Asked both uh, corporate real estate executives and economic developers to rank 17 factors in order of importance in getting a company to locate. And both groups agreed that in the early part of the process, incentives was only number 14 out of 17. However, when you got down to the last four to six semi-finalist communities that very frequently were very similar to each other in terms of accessibility and utility costs and labor availability and those sorts of things, incentives popped to the top of the list as the tiebreaker. Okay? So you need to be able to, to offer something without having to go to a town meeting to create it while the business prospect is sitting there uh, and is, you know, three to four month clock is, uh, is ticking. Uh, so effectiveness of local and regional teams, extremely, uh, extremely important. Uh, essential to have reasonable uh, availability of real estate uh, available now. Uh, as I work around the country, I will ask people either in municipalities or at the state level, what percentage of your initial prospect inquiries are looking for an existing building versus a greenfield site to build on? And historically, it has been 70 to 75% start out looking for a building rather than contemplating construction. 
Why? Faster? Uh, you know, buildings already there? Frequently can be less expensive unless the building needs lots of, uh, uh, lots of retrofit. It's been a higher percentage over the past uh, seven or eight years because of the recession that caused a great number of very nice buildings to uh, become vacant. And historically, about 60% of the projects that do go somewhere move into an existing building. It, again, has been higher lately because of the availability of, uh, of uh, good buildings. Sometimes a company will fall in love with a location but can't find the right building, and then they will bite the bullet and go through a design-build process and, and have to take the time to get the permits and, and so on and so forth. Bottom line here is, and it is the bottom line on the, on the slide, you got to have a reasonable inventory of uh, sites and buildings uh, if you're going to be of maximum competitiveness. Now this is a slide that will make you laugh or cry. Uh, if construction is necessary, so is fast track permitting. My site location consultant friends say they would like to get all of their local permits within 14 days and seven is better. <laughs> and they'd like to get all their state permits in a month and a half, month is, is better. Can you do that? There are places around the country that can't. And these are not you know, sleazy, downtrodden, desperate places. Uh, I'll give you some examples of what, what they're doing. You know, some places are giving their staff more authority to give out permits and approvals. You don't have to have a town meeting or a public hearing to make lots of these decisions. They are pre-permitting sites. They're taking a site through uh, the, the uh, development process and getting an approval for a building of up to X number of square feet within this box on the land that takes care of the setbacks, but there's actually no project involved. They're just saying if your project comes along and can fit in this box, uh, the site is already approved for development. Uh, more than half of the states have uh, shovel-ready or certified site uh, pro projects programs where sites have been run through an evaluation process, the stamp of approval has been put on them, uh, some of the due diligence that the companies would need to go through has already been done by the communities. Connecticut does not have a certified site uh, program, contemplated doing one a few years back, but uh, it has not become reality. Some examples of what the competition is doing. These are places I have worked. Claremont County, Ohio, suburb of Cincinnati one of the fastest growing uh, uh, counties out there. They have passed a county, well, they did two things. Number one, they took all of their permitting agencies, all of their departments, they built them their own separate freestanding building out on the highway with a big sign on the front that says, Permit Central. Now, give you an idea of what goes on there? Okay, that's where you go to get your, your permits. Then they passed an ordinance which said, if I am the business person and I come in with complete and accurate plans, onus is on me to make sure all the I's are dotted and T's are crossed, proposing to do a kind of project that is allowable in the zoning district for the place I am proposing to do it, I am guaranteed to have all of my county permits within 10 days. Requirement by ordinance. That's one of the things that's going on. Chesapeake, Virginia. A uh, suburb of the Norfolk Portsmouth area. They decided a few years back that they wanted to concentrate on corporate offices. They do two things. They have on the staff of the Economic Development Department a qualified licensed engineer that helps the businesses draw up the plans, and then they walk the plans across to the uh, permitting uh, agencies and say, yeah, plans are all done. And, and the town engineer, the city engineer say, yep, they are, clunk. Uh, you're good, good to go. Uh, they guarantee that if it's an office project in an office district, you'll have all of your permits, again, complete and accurate application, in two days. You're competing with these people sometimes for, for office locations. Phoenix and Peoria, Arizona. I've worked in Peoria twice. It's a, you know, ever heard of Peoria, Arizona? Yeah. yeah, most people have heard of Peoria, Illinois. Peoria, Arizona is 165,000 people in a community of 184 square miles. Most people have never heard of, okay? but great, great location. They and Phoenix 
have established a self-certification program where for certain types of development, this does not include places of public assembly, uh, things like that, but for certain types of development, uh, any architect and engineer who has been through the City of Phoenix's training program, and Peoria uses the City of Phoenix's uh, training program, can draw up the plans, put that architect or engineer's stamp on it, and it never has to get looked at by the city engineer. Uh, already approved uh, by virtue of having been done by a qualified ar architect and engineer. Now we can't do lots of these things in New England because the most widely practiced religion uh, around here is called home rule. Okay? It, home rule, while a wonderful concept, can get in the way of efficient uh, development. How many of you have got a requirement that a subdivision plan has to go through a public hearing? Did you know that's not required in the state of Connecticut? A lot of our communities require it. So anything we can do to streamline the development process, and Don is going to be talking about uh, uh, some of these concepts uh, uh, shortly, anything we can do will make us as a state more competitive and you as your community uh, more competitive. As I work around the country and I talk to business people and they say, ah, you're from Connecticut. Uh, you know, there's, there's three reactions. I used to live in Connecticut, but I left and I like it here way better. Or we considered Connecticut, uh, but it failed in that phase two process of comparison and we picked a different location. Or uh, I wouldn't touch Connecticut with a 10-foot pole or a 12-foot Hungarian. Uh, they, you know, we, we've got a negative image, not all of which is deserved, but not all of which is undeserved. Yep. Uh, Mark, the question on the certified or shoveled site yep. program, would that have to be at the state level or could it be? Uh, no. Uh, you can have your own local certification uh, program. The, the, the problem is that the lower down you get uh, on the ladder, uh, the more questionable it is in the minds of the business prospects that are looking at it. But there are, uh, uh, the CSX Railroad has its own certification program. The Tennessee Valley Authority has its own certification program. Uh, uh, there's a variety of different ways to do it where the imprimatur comes from a larger, more recognizable group than just a little local community. But uh, nothing, nothing to say it's not worth a try. It can be expensive. South Carolina's certification program costs roughly $50,000 per site to get the certification. Okay. Now, the way they offset that is that in South Carolina, the <laughs> electric utilities uh, are allowed to earmark some of their tax dollars to support community and economic development and that money is then used to pay the engineers to do the certification. So, so there's ways to, ways to get it done. Now economic developers, you know, we've already, once again, community's a product, we need to look at evaluation topics and we need to look at trade-offs, the costs and benefits of development. Here's another, don't look at the next slide. We're talking about what are the topics that community or that companies rather evaluate? What are the companies asking you about when they come into your community? We talked about some of them already. We talked about workforce, right? Location, accessibility, your business climate, quality of life. What else? Regulations, which are part of your business climate. Real estate, that was mentioned. I'm going to ask you about what do you got for places for us to go? Yep. <laughs> Political climate can be. Uh, and that may be increasing in importance in the current environment. Companies are, now, my office in the city of Milford used to be in a little building over in front of Milford Hospital. 
new mayor came in, he said, I consider community development to be one of my most important departments. I want to move you into City Hall. And I said, bull cookies. You know, we're not doing that. Uh, company executives don't want to have to march past the mayor's office in order to come and talk about uh, company needs, perhaps confidential kinds of needs. So I went into a building across the street instead of in uh, City Hall. Companies, we all are used to having either municipal economic development departments and or uh, economic development boards and commissions, right? That's the way of doing things pretty much uh, around here. That is not the most common way it gets done around the country. In other parts of the country, an economic development corporation that is separate from the government structure uh, is the more common way of doing things. That could be through a chamber of commerce or it could be a freestanding uh, economic development corporation. We didn't t put up here infrastructure, but that's your roads and utilities and telecommunications. Uh, we did talk education, facilities and services, taxes. Uh, most companies are willing to pay a dollar's worth of taxes as long as they feel like they're getting a dollar's worth of services of value uh, from, the, from the community. Uh, business, climate, quality of life, so on and so on and so on. Do these prioritize in any particular way? The magic answer is yes and no. They, they prioritize but differently for different kinds of companies and frequently for even for companies within the same uh, business sector. Save, uh, in, in my estimation, market access, which I think is probably the most important one because if you can't sell enough of your product or service from a certain location, you can't access an adequate market from that location, all the rest of these things become irrelevant or less relevant. We generally don't talk about market access when a business prospect comes into our office because they've already considered that before they came to look at our region or our community in the first place. So that's part of their due diligence that goes on in their office before they ever uh, come, come to, to see us. Now, another publication that comes out, Area Development Magazine, does an annual survey of business executives and site location consultants, two parallel surveys, and asks them to, to rate, to rank uh, you know, 20 some odd different uh, factors. And you can see that over time things go up, they go down, uh, but the top five typically stay the top five workforce, uh, uh, real estate, incentives, uh, those, those sorts of costs. Uh, so uh, if anybody's interested, I've got a multi-year uh, spreadsheet that looks at all those things over their annual survey for many, many years. This is a simple tool I call a community fix, uh, fit matrix uh, I created years back when I was working for a community that takes a couple of the things that we already looked at puts them into a matrix and helps you do a poor man's target industry study. Okay, if you were going to hire a consultant to do a target industry study, it would probably be a $25,000, $30,000 price tag or more. This looks at the various uses that we talked about. See right here, all the different uses that we were talking about, all of the evaluation factors that we were talking about, and you sit there in a, in a group meeting maybe with somebody from the Department of Economic and Community Development or your regional economic development group, somebody that knows what are the key factors for certain types of operation. Uses, evaluation factors, and you say, how well do these uses, you know, the numbers that are right here, match with these attributes of our community? I use a 10-point scale. You can use a 5-point scale, a 100-point scale, whatever you want to do, uh, and, and you start doing the evaluation. You add them all up. Some of them will not be applicable. Uh, number four was distribution facilities, and they didn't really need much by way of materials and supplies and those sorts of things. Or our tourism operation, which is number seven, we were saying utilities was not applicable because this was an outdoor recreation uh, you know, skating on a pond and fishing and mountain climbing and that sort of stuff. So fill in the uh, numbers, add them all up, divide it by the number of cells with uh, points so you don't include 
uh, the ones with not applicable, and you will get a fit score that begins to tell you what kinds of operations would fit best in your community. Uh, this can help you a lot in not wasting your marketing budget going after kinds of uh, facilities that may not fit in your community if they were interested. So it can be a, a simple tool to help you, help you with that. Good things, bad things, we're coming down the home stretch, so I'll show you what the common uh, things are here. We like to think of economic development as being the, uh, the white knight operation. Right? We're writing in to make our community uh, better, or maybe even to save it. And so we're doing that by creating more jobs or better jobs. The things that we've talked about, improving the standard of living of our, our residents, generating more tax revenues. If tourism is one of your targets, we didn't put that on our list, but tourism can be a, a, a target. Did you ever hear Monty Python's definition of the ideal tax? It is, the ideal tax is a tax on foreigners living abroad. Right? <laughs> Tourism is sort of like that, because you have these people from abroad who come in, leave their money, and go home. Uh, so so you know, tourism can be important that way. So you might want more tourists who stay longer in your hotels, buy more meals in your restaurants, uh, those sorts of things. And the availability of goods and services that we talked about. But there are some bad things. This is not a pure benefit situation. It is a benefit cost situation. Because as we bring more people into the community, more businesses in, into the community, we are using more of our available uh, capacity in different things. I just started a project last week in, in uh, Milton, Florida, suburb of Pensilva, uh, Pensacola. They have a sewage treatment plant with a 2.5 MGD, million gallons a day capacity, and they are currently using about 2 million of that. They're down to four to 500,000 gallons a day left. They can't do any large projects anymore. So, uh, so we need to you know, do a new sewage treatment plant to up, up the capacity, because the capacity has been uh, used up. Uh, environmental impacts, more cars can be more air pollution. So those cars can generate traffic, you know, cause congestion, cause uh, air uh, problems, safety problems. I wager that it doesn't matter how ardent an economic development proponent you are, if you've got an uh, eight-year-old child who needs to stand out waiting for the school bus and fully loaded 18-wheelers are rumbling by on the way to the nearby industrial park, you are going to be concerned. That's natural uh, for, for any parent, and there are lots of situations like that that, that are, are natural. We worry about sprawl. You know, our community is st starting to go farther and farther out, st you know, stressing uh, services even more because we have to extend them farther and farther. It gets uh, expensive. We're talking about population influx. Now, I had a friend of mine who ran an uh, economic development program out in Oklahoma. They had a double-digit unemployment rate, and they brought him in to fix this problem. And he was very successful to the point that they got the unemployment rate down to about 3.5 or 4%. And then people started to move into the community because there were still jobs there to be filled. And the local residents weren't real happy with these foreigners that were moving in. And they defunded his economic development program because he had been too successful. Okay. So, and part of that is down here, the bottom one, this is this whole aspect of change that you may cause through your economic and community development program. So we need to uh, keep that in mind. Functions of the full service economic development operation or organization, EDO is used to mean both of those things, tends to be 10 of them. Doesn't mean that you have to have one organization or operation that is doing all 10 of them. For instance, around the country, the training and human resources function is generally handled by our workforce investment boards or workforce development boards, and there should be a partnership between your economic development program uh, and uh, the workforce folks. 
but these are the, the 10 things that we typically spend a fair amount of time doing. Marketing your community. What's the difference between marketing and sales? My favorite uh, definition of marketing is that marketing is the art of human persuasion through the provision of information to solve problems. The provision of information to solve problems. Human persuasion. Company's got a problem, it's finding the right location. We provide information about our community to show them that our community can solve that problem. Marketing is stirring up interest. Sales is closing deals. You want to move from the first to the, to the second. Most common marketing approaches, there's a whole bunch of them. Okay? Different places do different things. Uh, you, you, you learn that marketing in order to be successful needs to be repetitive and needs to be multi-channeled. You can't be successful just doing one thing once a year, which means it also can be expensive, which means uh, that's why most regions around the, the uh, country use regional marketing. And once they get somebody to look at the region, then they'll start uh, drilling down into uh, communities. My friends at Development Counselors International do a survey every uh, four years, and they ask economic developers what marketing techniques work best, and you can see that the internet and websites has gone from roughly a third of EDOs in 2002 up to three quarters of EDOs now. That continually increases in importance, and you can see how uh, all these, at least, the ones that they include in their survey, stack up. Then they also ask business executives, what's your uh, favorite way of getting information about local business climates? And you can see the uh, top three are dialogue with industry peers. One of the reasons you go out and meet with your business executives as part of your retention and expansion program is to find out what's on their mind. I learned this way back again when I was a community development director in Milford and I took my mayor out to meet with the uh, general manager of a plant and we walk in and the mayor says so tell me what do you do here and the answer was lose money you know, yeah that ought to be a red flag in there somewhere you know you won't need to find out those things because if a businessman from Chicago comes and talks to a uh, business executive in your community and finds out that business executive doesn't like your community, you're in trouble. You've lost a potential project. So relationship build uh, and make sure you know what's uh, going on. Uh, increasingly, business executives are scoping out communities while they're doing business travel. So there should be an important linkage between your tourism program and your economic development recruitment uh, or, uh, program, articles in business magazines, you know, Fortune and, and uh, those kinds of magazines, or Wall Street Journal. Uh, so, so you see how those things stack up. You can see from business executives, direct mail and TV uh, shows and advertising, all real low in terms of their evaluation of uh, effectiveness of conveying your business climate information. So I already said multi-step, uh, increasing importance of electronic technology, community network marketing. I've worked with a couple of communities where the economic development department has put together a little uh, pocket size, extends out about this far, multi-panel, but folds up like the size of a business card, and they have 40, 50, 60, 100 business people who travel a lot who go around with these little brochures in their pocket, their purse, their briefcase, and when they strike up a conversation with somebody that's sitting on the, in the seat next to them on the plane, uh, and it says, yeah, we're thinking about doing a facility in you know, New England or New Jersey or North Carolina, whatever, they pull out the little brochure uh, and say, here, let me give you something about our community. It's got the contact information for our uh, economic development guy, uh, and, and uh, it just starts the dialogue uh, it's, it's part of the marketing uh, program. Uh, vision, good planning, that shapes your product and how you market your product, how you develop uh, your product. So there is a strategic planning aspect that feeds into your marketing. 
Flossonosa nihil pilification. I, I found this word uh, when Senator Robert Byrd, uh, he since died, but he was from West Virginia, and he actually used this word in a speech in the Senate. It means the action or habit of estimating something as worthless. What does that have to do with us? Not a damn thing, but it's such a great word. Isn't it? No, uh, uh, there, there have been articles in the Wall Street Journal, op-ed pieces in the Washington Post, uh, uh, articles in the learned economic development and planning journals that say economic development as we currently practice it is a waste of money. It's a zero-sum game. Companies will pick locations whether or not we take them to dinner, whether or not we give them incentives, whether or not we do a boondoggle trip to a trade show in Germany, you know, whatever. I don't s subscribe to that 100%, but I think we make the mistake of defining what we do in terms of what we said earlier, jobs and taxes, because we do so much more than just jobs and taxes. I think your mission, should you choose to accept it, cue up the, the uh, right music, would you please? Mission Impossible, uh, is building better places. We're in the business of building better communities in which to live, work, play, and run a business. Or stated somewhat differently, we're in the business of building successful communities. If the residents of our community feel like your economic development program is a success, they will support it, they will be part of it, they will welcome what you're doing. My favorite uh, example of this is a uh, industrial park up in Maine, relatively rural Maine. The industrial park is called First Park. Developed by 23, I think it is, might be 24 communities in collaboration. Relatively small rural. They all wanted business growth. They knew it was stupid to have 23 or 24 separate industrial parks, so they joined together and they built one and they have a revenue sharing uh, uh, approach so that uh, you know, any pro annual profits over expenses come from land sale, gets divvied up among the communities based on each community's pro rata share of the aggregate grand list. Well, add up all, com all of the community's grand list. Each community had a responsibility for their portion of the development costs and get uh, uh, their pro rata share of the benefits from development. And they all feel successful when they land a project as opposed to having 22 losers and one winner uh, when, when you have a, a project. So something, something to think about. Commercial office, uh, generally throughout Connecticut, especially in the Hartford market, soft or flat. Up here I have vacancy rates within the Hartford Central Business District. My number is at 30%. It's a higher number than you'll see typically in the media, or in media accounts, which are usually down around 18, 19%. But the SS I put next to it is what we call shadow space. And typically the way rents are, dis uh, the way vacancies are discussed in the commercial uh, markets is this idea that it's space for lease that is not leased uh, and this shadow space idea includes space that is leased but not occupied and the reason why we look at that shadow space is because before you're going to see any growth in the vacant uh, any decline in the vacancy rate and occupancies those shadow spaces have to fill up first so we look at the entire market and kind of this idea of this shadow space. Uh, suburbs are running better. The, the metropolitan region is running better around 20%. And we see numbers there for New Haven also. Lease, lease rates are running in the cities between 19 and 25. In the suburbs, uh, 17 to 25 or 19 to 28 dollars gross, which for us becomes, uh, from a development standpoint, from a planning st standpoint, becomes challenging in the sense that uh, typically new construction costs about $30 a square foot or needs to return a rent of about $30 a square foot. 
Therefore, in the office class, rents are running a bit lower than ultimate returns and therefore making it challenging to build new product. Office factors to watch, job creation and growth, population growth, business formations, obsolete buildings, uh, and I won't read through all of those. The chart I want to direct you to on the top right hand side is the average square foot per employee. Starting in 1970 at 600 square feet and landing in 2017 at 151 square feet. Think about that in the context of what I was just talking about with shadow space. The fact is, even with Forget any decline in jobs or decline in companies. Just if everything maintains the status quo, the contraction alone in the amount of square footage we're occupying uh, in office space could result in essentially, the numbers there, a two-thirds reduction in occupancy. So this creates, this is kind of the intersection between you know, the property markets, and then also our lifestyles, how we engage in these spaces. And the fact is we're using less office space than before. Factors playing into this, you know, home shoring of employees, uh, office hoteling spaces, and so forth and so on, and just the contraction overall space, going to things like utilizing laptops rather than utilizing PCs and so forth. Uh, U.S. factors, uh, usage factors shrinking over time, we also see here uh, we also see here a decline in ultimately the usage of space, square footage of space. In the industrial market, for the first time, I think in a long time, we're actually seeing some positive signs. Absorption is up, vacancy rates are down, lease rates are actually up a little bit, even though they're still pretty low. Uh, there is a flight to quality, that is the movement away from older spaces to newer spaces, which gets back to that similar case with the retail, uh, that older, functionally obsolete spaces are becoming more challenging. Uh, the redevelopment of Class B spaces and focus on location, highway access, and distribution, especially in the Hartford market, kind of the areas, the communities north of Hartford, Windsor, and Bloomfield seeing some positive uh, growth here in the distribution centers as it's a good location to service the New England market. And this image uh, on the top here is essentially the new Trader Joe's uh, distribution facility going in in Bloomfield. Multifamily residential, substantial new activity probably over the past, since the market crash, since probably about 2010, we've been seeing substantial multifamily development uh, in general tracking permits. Prior to 2008, probably only about 18% of the uh, residential product being built was multifamily. Since 2010 on to today, about 45 to 50% of total residential product being built in Connecticut has been multifamily. Uh, solid interest from buyers and investors, strong rents and leasing activities for new product. I think part of this strength in this new product market is the fact that after the last crash back in the late 80s, early 90s, and what was going on with condo development at that time, a lot of communities put on the brakes from a use perspective and zoning, and we really allowed very little multifamily product to be built. So the fact is our existing multifamily market is already 20 uh, to 30 years old, outdated in kind of its amenities, and therefore creating this demand uh, creating part of the demand for the newer product. Once again, a flight to quality, that newer modern product doing the best, Class C properties starting to struggle, and seeing the rehab and reinvention of Class B properties. So in general, as we know in Connecticut, we have a challenging market. Uh, job growth and business formation has been stagnant uh, for many decades now, substantial persistence vacancies, Tenancy, tenant concessions in short terms, buyer and tenants uh, market, absence of new retail and office development, multifamily residential and mixed use development seems to be the direction we're heading in more, and projections continued modest recovery. Essentially, trends to watch the public private partnership being becoming more uh, common, especially even now seeing 
um, municipalities offering tax incentives for multifamily residential development, not just for commercial development. Office and tenants, small companies are where we're seeing the greatest lease ups. Uh, new government regulations, tax reform. Last week, uh, I believe there was an article in the Hartford Current that was kind of positive about the new federal uh, defense budget with the $700 billion and how that will benefit our local defense industry. Pratt & Whitney has already seen some growth in recent years, expanding uh, their research and development activities. So there may be some positive news on the job fronts related to defense manufacturing, but we'll see to what extent that plays out. Ultimately, technology driving a lot of changes, adaptive reuse of older buildings, still this focus on EDS and MEDS, and other things like crowdfunding of development, mixed uses, and really this significant shift to hospitality, food and drink uh, within the retail service sector. So, big picture related to all this, some of it has to do with our demographic structure, our socioeconomic structure, and essentially we see here a uh, population pyramid of the world population in 1950, 2010, and 2050. Essentially, we are getting older. As you see, the top end starts looking less and less like a pyramid with more persons at the top. It's even more significant for a country like the United States, where, as you can see, the shape of the pyramid on the left, which is 1980, and 2013 on the right. I think I have two more things there. At the bottom, in red, we see the millennial uh, population cohort and then essentially the back end, uh, the transition between the baby boomers and ultimately the uh, generation X generation. If we move forward to the next one, we see this is projected out to 2030, and we see our population structure becoming more like a silo. We could put a line, if I can do this without shutting this off, we could put a line at retirement age across here, we could put a line at 18 years old across here, and we could say that these are young dependents, government responsible for supporting through things like education, and then old dependents above, Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, and then ultimately in the center would be the workforce. As you're getting older, as we're having fewer kids, uh, but still having having fewer kids per household, but still having more kids based on the sheer size of the population. We have more young dependents, more old dependents, and a smaller contracting workforce. That means us, the taxpayers, to support those populations. This graphic stuns me every time I look at it. Percent of all college degrees, females versus males, from 1966 to 2018. And you see the increase in females, decrease in males. I think this is really significant when we start talking about things like changes in retailing uh, or changes that we engage in different types of commercial spaces. Uh, Re-entry of women into the workforce in the 1970s, uh, change in house household structures where we marry later, we have fewer kids, we marry less often. The most predominant household now is a single person household. And you add all these things together, and all of a sudden you see things like there's more restaurants than there's ever been before. Well, when no one's staying home and cooking three meals a day like my mother did, uh, then that starts to make sense that we are engaging in places differently. The shift to the value of experience away from kind of the materialistic product is also kind of pointing to this contraction or struggles within the retail industry. It's not just about online purchasing. It's also about we're more likely to buy food and drink than we are a material product. Just another graphic that you can see, because you guys will have access to these slides, of the breakdowns of shares of population male and female by age cohorts. So lessons to be learned uh, for the design of projects, create connections and provide experiences. Kind of this focusing maybe more so on placemaking than we previously did. Uh, add social value, also part of the placemaking. Create more inviting, an uh, more inviting an atmosphere, more flexible facilities.
providing communication links, and focus on place and placemaking, as I already said. But don't doubt the value of physical presence. Retail is not going away. Office space is not going away. It's going to change. We're probably going to see continued contractions. But physical presence is still going to be meaningful, maybe just in different ways. For me, this is the jumping off point now into talking about kind of planning and land use in the sense that I think we have to recognize that times have changed. And the way we approach, especially zoning, up until now, uh, I think has reached a point that maybe is not working and we need to think about changing how we approach it. And that will be kind of the thrust of what I talk about here. For me, economic development, I, I define it personally, similarly to Mark, but a little bit different in a short, simple sentence, is the work of creating wealth and attracting investment. For me, the outcome, my kind of desired outcome of economic development is to, uh, to position or reposition a community to become a socially and economically healthy, vibrant, prosperous, and resilient place that can compete for wealth and investment. How do we actually compete for wealth? How do we actually compete for investment? Creating wealth, the typical stuff, kind of attracting jobs, increasing uh, quantity and quality of jobs, wages, incomes. Attracting investment, the willingness of outsiders, locals, uh, existing businesses, existing residents to invest not just money, but also time and energy in the community. I'm always clear that when I speak of investment, it's not just about money, it's about time and energy. <clears throat> and then just being clear about the words that I'm using, kind of what they mean. I think it's important to healthy, full of strength and vigor, vibrant en uh, energy, enthusiasm and activity, prosperous, economic well-being, flourishing, wealthy, resilient, the capacity to absorb shock, uh, and retain function and structure. So what is planning? Simplest way, a process of preparing for the future. Simplest way to define it. It's also a systematic approach to problem solving, a strategy for improvement, a continual process of learning and adjustment, and what I like the most is a prediction of the future with the risk of being wrong. I think we always have to keep in mind that there's a risk of being wrong in planning. Two examples I want to give is, one, if your community was doing your comprehensive plan in 2006, we were at the top of the bubble. Every trend line, population, housing, land consumption, you name it, was trending up, right? And then in 2008, the market collapsed. All your assumptions going into that plan was dealing with growth. And then we went into a stage of contraction. That's the risk of being wrong. I have a recent client who their plan recommended a certain type of uh, community facility to be designed and constructed. And they went through a lengthy year-long process of doing that. And ultimately, uh, at referendum, that project got shot down. From the persons involved in the planning, you know, they viewed that as a failure of implementation. From my perspective, it's just the reality of the process. We had a good idea. We tried to move it forward. The majority of the residents did not agree with it. It didn't go forward. From a work plan perspective, we did implement. From a, you know, achieving the objectives of the plan, we fell short. But that is this risk of being wrong in the future. Everything doesn't always come to fruition. I want to juxtapose planning as a process against planning as these other things. I think we often focus too much on planning as being urban design and architecture, planning as zoning and land use, or as smart growth and fighting sprawl, or traditional neighborhood development, or transportation-oriented development. These are all tools and mechanisms that when we use within planning, but planning itself is a process. And I think we need to keep focused on that. So role of land use commissions in economic development. Uh, I kind of chuckle inside every time I read that uh, title there, because I'm not sure many land use commissions view their role as actually being economic development. 
So the planning commission is charged with creating the plan of C&D, plan of conservation and development, uh, that clearly states the wants of the community, what the community wants uh, and where. It recognizes that land use uh, and infrastructure investment policies allocate the supply, or we need to recognize that they allocate the supply of uh, land density and intensity of development and this is directly related to capital improvements. So let me explain this a little bit. I view actually the plan of C&D as not just a land use plan and not just simply a strategic community facilities plan, but as this, those two things combined as really an allocation of land. In some ways, from a government standpoint, we get to plan for the supply of land. That is, we get to determine through this planning process how much land will be available for what types of uses, commercial, residential, uh, industry, so forth and so on. And then within those categories, what types of residential? So we have actually a significant say from a policy perspective, from a planning perspective, in land supply. We have very little say in demand, which is socioeconomic and demographically driven. The Zoning Commission, the zoning regulations and the zoning map are a plan for the future uh, development of the community. They're a powerful tool to implement the land use strategies and policies within the plan of conservation and development. Uh, they should clearly state what you want and where, use, density, and intensity. I'm going to come back to this in a moment. Uh, or actually, I'll stop at it now. I keep on saying, should clearly state what we want, where, and how. And the fact is, I think we get this backwards sometimes. Uh, and I think it's the reason why we see contentious land use approval processes and a lot of denials at the land use level. And what I mean by this is the POCD, the planning process, is the time to make those land use decisions. What types of uses do you want and where? And that's the land use plan, the future land use plan, that shows this is where we want commercial development. This is where we want residential development. And it should also be stating what kinds of commercial development we want. The zoning regs are then the tool to implement that. And the zoning regs, to some degree, should be implementing the policies of the plan kind of following along with zoning that allows for those kinds of uses in those locations. By the time we get to the application, we should already feel comfortable with the applications that are before us, but we don't. So many communities today rely very heavily on the last bullet here, the conditional use permit, the special permit. So we say we want industrial development warehousing, distribution, manufacturing. And then our zoning regs say, we want those in industrial zones, but you need a special permit to do them. Wait a second. Didn't we decide we want an industrial zone? Why are we special permitting the uses that we want? So I think we need to shift this focus to the stuff that we truly want, and that's a decision to be had in the plan, should be administrative approvals, site plan, either by staff or by commission. The stuff that, based on its unique circumstances, raises additional concerns can be held for special permit or reserved for the conditional use. So the role of the Land Use Commission, the Economic uh, Development Commission specifically, my general feeling is the Economic Development Commission should also engage in the planning process, either with the planning commission or on their own doing their own economic development plan for uh, where they want economic investment in the community. What, where, how. Support the business community, promote and market your community, and also advocate social and economic growth. That includes business, housing, and infrastructure. Let's get back to, I'll start with the infrastructure at the bottom, get back to the idea of investment. If you've owned a home, you know that you have to invest in your home over time for an, in order for it to maintain value, regardless of what's going on in the marketplace. Strong market will help you. 
uh, weak market may constrain you. But if you don't do the roof every 20 to 30 years, if you don't upgrade the ele electrical, add the, you know, upgrade to uh, central air conditioning and so forth, Without those investments, your property is not going to grow its value or retain its value the same as it would if you did them. In some ways, we have to think the same about our communities. We need to invest in our public roads, sewer, water, into our school systems, into our senior centers, our community centers, and all that stuff. Those are not just tax dollar expenditures on projects. They are actually investments in our community. In the discussion with Mark, a lot of those things get at the quality of life of our community. The access, uh, the accessibility or quality of our location in, comparative, in comparison to other places. It creates essentially the platform on which economic development can take place. Number two, housing. I think we've been housing averse, residential averse in this state for a long time. Uh, I was at a uh, community meeting last night where I had a member of the town uh, volunteer fire chief and in the first segment of the meeting he said he didn't want any more residential development in the town we needed to stop this the town was losing its character half hour later in the discussion he said my firefighters can't find homes affordable to them in our town and are leaving <laughs> and I'm not picking on him. I've heard this time and time again. I like to think of housing as where jobs go at night. The fact is, there's a symbiotic relationship between housing and economic development. So if we want economic development, if we want to grow businesses, grow jobs, which means we will grow population, then we also need to be able to provide housing for them. So we can't disconnect housing from the discussion of economic development. For Economic Development Commission, speak in favor of land use commissions. I do a lot of work on the developer side, representing developers before commissions. I've been doing that kind of work since 2002. I've probably represented over 100 projects, and only once, once, have I seen a chairman of an Economic Development Commission show up at a planning hearing and speak in favor of the development. We need more of that. If you are promoting economic development, because in the land use process, those opposed are the ones who turn out in large numbers. Those who are satisfied and content or supportive, don't. The Economic Development Commission needs to be an advocate. So embrace, embrace development, embrace change, and be a voice uh, for change and continuous improvement in your community as an economic development commission. The planning commission and comprehensive planning uh, in a bit more detailed fashion here. So the plan of conservation and development is a physical plan for the community. It is a land use plan first and foremost. Has some socioeconomic, demographic, and maybe economic development components to it, but it's really focusing on land use. It's long range covering a period of 10 years or more. That why, that's why this whole idea of subject to change or the risk of being wrong. It's comprehensive and that includes the entire community. And it's a statement of policy. Most important, it is a guide to decision making. I often hear people talk about the plans that stay on the shelves. You know, we do all this planning and then they just sit on the shelves. My usual response is, well, I guess you're not a planner. Because uh, when I was a municipal planner, my plan of C&D was in my hand for every meeting I attended. It was the starting point of my decision-making process. Someone wants to do something, whether it was you know, a government agency or a private developer. What does the plan say on this topic? How do I interpret it? And it's not just that document for me, the planner, or for the Planning and Zoning Commission, it should be that document for all the municipal agencies. So this effort to pull in the rest of government into this planning process becomes critical. The general themes of the POCD, I don't want to focus too much here on, just kind of laid them out, but this idea of protecting natural resources, conservation of open space, working lands, recreation, 
<laughs> residential uses, commercial uses, you guys get the picture. Uh, I don't want you to come away thinking, or others shouldn't think, that it's all or none in the sense of, you know, economic development is anti-conservation, or conservation is anti-economic development. The way it plays out sometimes feels that way, but we can actually have both, and it's a world of gives and gets. If you want something, if you want to get something, you're probably going to have to give something. So if you want the resources to preserve working lands in open space, then you need the tax base to have those resources. So you're going to need the economic development and maybe vice versa. Uh, so we have to recognize that in this, where it ties back to land use, there are places in the town best suited for commercial and industrial development and places in the town best suited for conservation and preservation. There are times they may overlap a bit. But recognizing if these areas are where we are going to grow our grand list, create our tax base through economic development, then we need to do that. And we shouldn't be opposing that through arguments of conservation and preservation. Have to figure out how to get it working together. So, the future land use plan, which most POCDs kind of end with, it shows the spatial organization of land use in the community, the graphic representation of desired policy outcomes, or the geographic representation, and essentially creating a physical guide to present and future development. Uh, this can go a long way in all of our decision making. Market and economic development implications. This goes back to some of what I already started to say in this idea that recognizing that the POCD as a land use document has the ability to establish policies that allocate the supply of land. Essentially the allocation of supply of land by use. How much land are we making available for commercial development or for multifamily development? And at what density are we going to allow that land to be developed? You can very quickly see that is a direct impact on the supply side of the market. My reason for beating a drum on this is I often think planning sees itself separate and different from the market. The market and you know, the developers, they're four-letter words. That's bad, and we need to you know, protect and conserve. But the fact is, we're engaged in the marketplace. We have control over supply to some degree. So we have to be intentional and clear as to what it is we want, where we want it, and how we want it. And therefore, set the stage for the supply side of the market. Establish the policies that spatially distribute and allocate the public infrastructure then to support that supply of land. Where are we going to invest? How are we going to invest? What do we value? So the capital improvements plan, the capital improvements budget, is something that should be directly linked to the POCD. How are we going to make investments to support the economic development of our con commercial and industrial zones, lands? When you start bringing those two things together, I think you can start making some kind of big picture uh, or foundational inroads into the idea of economic development. So the zoning commission. Fundamentals of zoning. Uh, you know, if you kind of think in basic terms of property rights and markets and government regulations, uh, we tend to think of zoning as being restrictive. And it is restrictive to some degree, but it's also part of the marketplace. It's ingrained into it. So the legal authority to regulate the use, density, and intensity of land is evolved out of nuisance law, protecting public health, safety, and welfare. And it authorizes governments to regulate and restrict height, number of stories, size of buildings, other structures, Percentage of land that can be occupied, size of yards, courts, open spaces, density of population, location and use of building structures, and land for trade, industry, residence, and other purposes. Economic development is clearly within that purview. 
based on lands for trade, industry, and so forth. It goes on to say this foundation of the police, police powers of government and so forth that uh, to lessen congestion in the streets, to secure safety from fire, panic, and other dangers, to promote health, general welfare, and provide adequate light and air, to prevent the overcrowding of land and undue concentration of population. I'll let you finish. Uh, my question to you is, how many of you live in fear of fire, panic, and flood? <laughs> so this is really tied to 1920s, what zoning was created to solve, the challenges of the industrial city. So in one way I can look at this and go, it succeeded. Zoning actually did what it was supposed to do. We no longer live in fear of these things through the regulation of land use. And that's great. Uh, I also have to give credit to other things, building codes, life safety codes, changes in maybe just our expectations on the quality of space and so forth. It's not all about zoning, but it does deserve credit to solve that problem. So let me ask you the question. If this is what zoning's charged to do, and we've solved that, what's zoning doing today? One is I'll say, well, I'm not advocating to get rid of zoning, because if we got rid of it, I think we would slip back towards these things. It wouldn't be the same, because industry and conditions aren't the same. But zoning has provided a stability and predictability within the marketplace that helps the economics of our economy function that when you buy a property, you know what you can use it for and you know what your neighbor's uses are and you don't have to worry about a slaughterhouse showing up next to you know, your small apartment building. Uh, but in that sense, there's a lot of provisions within zoning or early provisions within zoning. Uh, Such regulations shall be made with reasonable consideration among other things, character of the district, peculiar suitability for particular uses, and the view of conserving the value of buildings. And we see the value of buildings come up from time to time within the statutory language for zoning, all the way back to the Enabling Act in the 1920s and up to our modern day state statutes. Uh, the fact is, part of zoning's role is not just about public health, safety, and welfare. It is about this protection of the value of buildings and further tied to this idea of its economic role. Now, I would also argue that if we're not protecting public health, safety, and welfare, fear of panic, fire, and flood, that more of what zoning is doing today is actually protecting the value of buildings. That it's become a tool for metering or regulating the value of property. And that's probably where a lot of the stuff like nimbyism and lack of confidence in the commission to do uh, site plans or permits by staff. We want to retain that control for the special permit just in case. Uh, and there's positives to that, but there's also negatives. The permitting process has grown, I would say, into a burdensome, uh, pro into a burdensome process, and we'll talk more about that as I go through this presentation. So comprehensive plan of zoning. Zoning regulations and the MAC collectively create a comprehensive plan for the development of the community. Uh, as we see there in the second one, zoning as a plan is a powerful tool for, work, for the work of economic development. It is through the comprehensive plan of zoning the community sets forth the regulatory provisions, the density, uh, the desired outcomes that it wants, the uses and density of development, uh, what we want versus what we don't want. And this gets to my point once again of this need to be intentional. We really need to be intentional in the construction of our land use regulations as to the uses that we want. And if you want them, I'm not saying don't regulate them. I'm a big fan of really strict site design standards. But allow them through the least cumbersome approval process as your risk appetite allows you to. Basically, reserve the special permit for the very unique circumstances. And don't make the uses that you most want special permits. And I'll talk more about this 
right here. So this comes from a community, it's a Connecticut community, I, not revealing who they are. But my question is, is this an intentional plan for economic development? This is one of their industrial districts. Use is authorized without a zoning sign off. You can do open space, passive recreation, and public utility substations with no permits whatsoever. Sign off by staff, nothing's allowed. Sign off by site plan, banks, daycares, municipal facilities, offices, parking areas, personal service shops, retail stores, schools, colleges, public and private, and warehouses less, less than 1,000 square feet. That's the as of right commission approval. Authorized by special permit, adult oriented establishments, alcohol, sales. The bulky waste stuff was municipal, so I'm not really considering it there as industrial related uses. Cemeteries, commercial kennels, fabrication, leaf composting facilities, manufacturing, museums, skip down to warehouses in excess of 100,000 square feet. This is an industrial zone. When you look at this reg, does this community want industry? No. The first message that says to me is, we want banks and daycare centers. Those are the first permitted commercial uses that I come across within this regulation. Now, it's very easy for me to stand up here and kind of poke fun at this, but I think it's important for us to understand kind of where have we gone with this idea of zoning. I get why banks and daycare centers are there. You need those things to actually support your industrial businesses, to support the commercial areas of your town. People going to work want to be able to drop off their kids at daycare. People want to be able to run out at lunch and take care of some banking and so forth. Those uses do go together. But why is it that the manufacturing, fabrication, and warehouse uses within the industrial district are via special permit? From a planning perspective for me, that doesn't make sense. We already went through the comprehensive plan and decided this area of the community should be industrial. We then went through a zoning process to establish a zoning district to, to some extent, mirror the land use plan for this is where we're going to have industrial development. But in doing so, we kind of put on the brakes and said, we're not too sure about these industrial uses. They better be special permits. I actually fault the planning part of this process, and I kind of fault us as planners, those of us who are planners, and that I'm not sure we engage in the meaningful conversation that we needed to engage in during the planning process to make those decisions about what it is we truly want in this industrial location, or to confront the fact that we actually don't maybe want industry or industrial uses, that what we want is a commercial zone in this location with maybe some limited industrial related uses. And if that's the case, that's fine. I'm not telling a community they have to do what I say from a use perspective. But what I'm saying is this maybe shouldn't be called an industrial zone. Maybe we should call it intensive commercial or something else. But by calling it an industrial zone, I think we are setting yourself up for misinterpretation. If I'm representing a developer, helping them find the site, and I go to the industrial district, the first message this sends to me is we're going to have a long, cumbersome, challenging process ahead of us, unless we want to do a bank or a daycare center. So planning versus market. I had another planner yell at me a few years ago that, I liked market too much. And I was just kind of shocked by it. I was like, I never really viewed it as one or the other. The fact is, my work as a planner intersects with and intervenes with the marketplace. So planning in many ways is often viewed as something different or independent from the market. Uh, approached as an anti-market process or as a means of coercing the market. Market for me is the social, cultural, and economic forces that drive and shape the flow and spatial organization of investment, investment decisions and behaviors. 
it's not just about money and financial investment. It's also about kind of our social cultural way of being, what we find acceptable, what our risk appetite is, what we like from an aesthetic perspective. The community I was talking about that had the uh, public facility investment in their plan that they worked on for a year and it got shot down in referendum. Uh, from my perspective, it was actually the market, even though it was a referendum vote, it was the market that actually killed that project. The fact is, the plan called for a very dense level of development in the town center, which has become a common narrative today, right? But when the design finally came before the community of what this density meant, the location of the building out near the street, the number of stories of it, I sat through countless meetings just being an observer in the back of the room and watching the public go, ugh. It's too big. The fact is, the cultural way of being for that community was much more suburban than the density that was put forward. And they were uncomfortable with that. And that's part of the marketplace. Our consumer behaviors, our consumer tastes and appetites are part of this thing that we call the market. And as planners, we need to be sensitive, sensitive to that. So planning and market are interrelated and have a symbiotic relationship that is critical to understanding, uh, critical to understand if we are to plan for economic development. Top right side, I'll get to this left side. Top right side, uh, I have this graphic that says understanding place. And it says market, who and what is there, capacity, what abilities and behaviors, conditions, how things look and feel, an image, what signals are being sent. This is something I use typically when I'm working in more struggling communities, especially when I arrive in a place, arrive in a place for the first time. And I have to kind of get a feel. So I'll go out driving around, I'll go out walking around, and it's kind of like I ask myself, who and what is here? You know, maybe what capabilities does this population, this community, this governance structure have? What are the conditions? How does this community look? And then what are the signals being sent related to image? So I was working in a, what I would call a weak market community where what was there was pretty depressing. Uh, from a commercial business perspective, it was all dollar generals and so forth. Uh, the capacities, as I learned, I couldn't view these, but the capacities of government were very limited. Uh, they were an unsophisticated community that struggled with the everyday stuff. We're now faced with a natural disaster that uh, really challenged their ability to function. Uh, conditions, how things looked and felt, not very good. We all know this. We all know those places where we're driving along, everything's fine. And then you just kind of go, huh. And you might even go, huh, time to lock the door. Uh, just the feeling of the environment changes where, for whatever reason, we all have different risk appetites. But at some point, the place is not feeling as safe as it was or is not conveying positive messages. And then the image. And that's those signals and signs that are being sent. You know, the negative attributes or the positive attributes. So get into a planning process with this community and start going through kind of visioning and asking them different things. The one thing that kept on coming up is they kept on telling me they wanted a Starbucks. And I was like, with all the things in the world, and just so you know, the natural disaster, this was greater New Orleans region post-Katrina. Uh, 2008, and then again in a planning process in 2012, and they keep on telling me they want a Starbucks. And it took me the longest time to figure out what they're actually saying to me, but I think it's important. I could say, I could break this down into many more categories, but very simply put, there's two types of communities, a Starbucks community and a Dunkin' Donuts community. Now, if you look at the Connecticut landscape, almost every town in Connecticut can have a Dunkin' Donuts, can't you? 
very few towns can actually have a Starbucks, right? And when you look across the landscape of where those Starbucks are, the overwhelming majority of those Starbucks are actually in the wealthiest communities or in a very high traffic location where enough persons of wealth pass by the site. So now everyone gets to have a Starbucks. What this community was telling me in Louisiana was they wanted to be middle class again. That was the message that they were conveying to me. But that's this idea of who is there. So, and I'll come back to that in the next slide. So planning should work to manage the complexities of the socioeconomic, of socioeconomic space in place. Understanding the functions of cities, towns, and governments, integrating the social, cultural, and economic forces with the role of governance, and paying attention to the slow-moving uh, variables, which will be the focus of my next few slides. But this slide is about market being who's there. We often talk about market as kind of trade area. You know, who can we attract in in the 30-minute drive time or whatever? But that's trade area. Market is who's actually there. So if all your main street storefronts are boarded up, that's your market. If your only businesses are dollar general and family dollar, that's your market. So this is median sales prices, housing sales prices, single family housing sales prices within the New Orleans metropolitan region the six or seven parishes that make up the region. And the blue line is the regional, the metropolitan median. That's them all combined. My client is the bottom one. Pre-Katrina, Katrina and the collapse in the recovery period of which I was working with them. They were the weakest community before Katrina and they were the weakest community after the Katrina. On the right-hand side of that slide are the retailers present by community. So the Dillards and Nordstroms are in the high wealth communities, tiered down then to the Targets and Starbucks and so forth, some national chains and local chains, middle of the road, you know, Home Depots, uh, then stepping down to the Walmarts and Dollar General. My community was a Dollar General Walmart community. So when they say they want a Starbucks, they're really saying they want to be like their neighbors. They want to be more middle class. My point here from a planning perspective and from an economic development perspective, creating a Starbucks community means we have to approach things a certain way. And we really have to focus in on how are we going to attract investment into a place that nobody wants to invest? And how are we going to create and grow wealth within the community? And that's a challenge. That's not easy to do. It can be done, but you also have to let the community know this is a 10 to 15 year process. We're not getting you a Starbucks tomorrow or in two years, or in five years. But we can set that as our outcome for 15 years out and start working towards it. So this is a county, the number of jobs between 1998 and 2012. My client was a small community within this county. So jobs grew from, and this is the slow moving variables, jobs grew from 53,000 to almost 58,000 over this period of time. I guess we could say this is positive. It's pretty flat, but it's some growth. I just now want to take a look at some other ways of viewing this data or other data sets in this same location. So this is the same job growth, the same job table, broken out by sectors. Uh, the reddish color is manufacturing. The blue is educational, healthcare, and social assistance. Finance, insurance, real estate is in orange, and retail, arts, and entertainment and recreation are in green. So while jobs grew, my community's primary source of economic development was the mill that founded it. In 2008, the mill closed, gone forever. 
From their perspective, their problem started in 2008. I'm not convinced it did. Manufacturing was already in decline well before 2008. Slow moving variable if we paid attention to that. But the other categories also become interesting to me. Educational services, healthcare, and social assistance. These are the nonprofit organizations were slowly creeping up, which was probably an indication of the trouble they weren't viewing. And then the shift away from manufacturing to service oriented, recreational, arts, entertainment, and so forth. And this is, they also have a bit of a tourism industry in this place. This shift away from what had been their base manufacturing to kind of a new sector of business and employment. So this is my community within that county. As I said, they think their problem started in 2008 when the mill closed. Their population numbers speak differently. I have the benefits of viewing this chart now. It's really hard to see such a decline in the moment. And that's why my comment here is about kind of really focusing in on slow moving variables across multiple data sets. So if I now go to the next data set, school enrollments, 1999 to 2013. That may have been telling us something also. It wasn't just population contraction, it's these school enrollments. The median age is actually going through the ceiling in this community, plus 60. And the fact is, why is it going through the roof? because the young persons in need of work were fleeing to other places. So those remaining were the oldest. And those people fleeing for work were taking their children with them. This is single family housing permits in the state of Connecticut from late 1980s to 2015. After the crash in the late 80s, it looks like for the next 15 years we created a new normal. We went from a high of 29,000 statewide housing permits a year, I think in 88, to between 9,000 and 11,000 over the next 15 years. And then we hit the next economic collapse. And actually the back end of this chart really kind of looks the same as the front end of this chart. So I ask you, have we started a new norm of about 3,000 to 5,000 housing permits per year. Is there a slow moving variable of change in this? What's been happening to our school age population? From 2011, statewide, loss of 33, 6,000, 3,500, 4,900, 3,500, 4,500. Those are statewide declines in school age population. My client town was up top there when I compiled this data. It lost 450 students over this period of time. They have a school system with capacity for 3,900 students, a high school with capacity for 1,900 students, and they have 2,200 students in the total system and are shedding about 100 students per year, projected to continually decline. We talk about we need to stop sprawl, we need to stop housing, we need to conserve open space, we need to protect agriculture. I'm not saying we shouldn't do some of those things and have to think carefully about how we do them, but we've been doing that for a long time, or attempting to do that. And we've been requiring special permits for almost every single use. I have a community I'm working in right now. For a single family house, you need a special permit. Every single use in the zoning regulations requires a special permit. <coughs> unless we solve, from my perspective, the permitting side, and unless we openly state that we actually want economic development, then I think these trend lines will continue. So, the challenge of planning uh, for land use. 
Planning for optimal or ideal land uses often misses the connections to social, cultural, and economic forces, market forces. For example, the desire for higher density mixed use <laughs> development that may conflict with the market desires uh, may conflict with market uh, realities. This is the example of my client who wants a high density mixed use town center that then had the general populace freak out when they were confronted with a three-story building built out to the sidewalk. There's a disconnect there. I'm not saying we shouldn't strive for higher density or mixed use. What I am saying is through the planning process, we need to be more sensitive to what the appetite of the community actually is. Desire to preserve open space, space may reduce the supply of land and raise the cost of land. Every time you pull land out of the marketplace, you're taking away supply. And therefore, you start, you're creating constrictions for demand. Once again, that's not to say we shouldn't preserve open space. I'm totally for it. But maybe as part of our conserving open space, we look at things like transfer of development rights. Take the density from the locations you want to preserve and place them in the locations you want to develop. You can do both. It's not all or one. The desire to reduce education costs associated with residential development may result in aging population, stagnation, and decline. Hmm. I'm continually confronted by communities, both as clients I'm working for the community and both as a representative of developers, with this idea of the cost of school-aged children. And we need to stop residential development because school-aged children cost too much. In that example of my client that just lost or that community, they weren't my clients, I was working for a developer. In that example of the community that just lost 450 students, I did a comparison of their per pupil spending in 2013 to 2017. And this is what I found. Adjusted for inflation, they were spending $100 more per pupil in 2013 than they were in 2017, even though the total spending per pupil went up $4,000 per student over that time. Why? They lost 450 students. So the per pupil spending today is being spread over fewer students than it was being spread over then. And the fixed costs of the facilities, the capacity for 3,900 students that they're almost 2,000 shy of achieving and contracting are what's driving the per pupil spending, not the students themselves. The fact is they could absorb probably a thousand students with very minimal increase in cost. And when a developing comes in and it's going to be 120 units of multifamily housing for in generating you know 16 school-aged children into a system that just lost 450 students I assure you there's no negative impact from those 15 students. So we need to get around this kind of anti-ness to what I actually think is anti-community. If we're stopping families and we're stopping kids, then our, we're destined to meet my client in northern Maine there that is a bunch of 62-year-olds plus. And that's where our demographics are heading. We are above median age average of the nation as a whole. We're at the higher end. I believe Connecticut's at 41. I think the country's down around 37. That doesn't sound like much, but it's meaningful spread over the whole entire population. And I have seen some specific communities in Connecticut, some of our smaller communities in Connecticut with ages, median ages up around 60. That should be concerning. So the limits of planning, comprehensive plans often contain, uh, I don't want to say only, but limited objectives and strategies and little else. Sometimes there are lists of inputs and outputs without clear objectives or outcomes. I want to differentiate between inputs, outputs, and outcomes. For me, inputs and outputs are counting numbers. So in, in context of work I've done in housing, you know, uh, we'll measure the success of our efforts in housing based on, you know, 
How many persons did we put through a first-time home buyer program? You know, we educated 26 people this year, and we, issued, and we successfully graduated all 26 of those, and 12 of those persons went on to purchase a house. So we list out those numbers. Not that those numbers aren't important, but in the context of the neighborhood I was working in, while those numbers showed that we were doing stuff, the question was, was the neighborhood improving? That's actually the outcome. Is it getting better? In Connecticut, is economic development, is our economic environment activity getting better? Jobs have been stagnant. The number one demand driver for housing, for commercial space. Jobs have been stagnant since 1990. We've seen little to no job growth. Is what we're doing getting us what we want? Uh, so most of the time, desired outcomes, uh, measures for improvement, and evaluations of impact are missing. I rarely see plans where we set up the measures for improvement. We say all the things we need to do and we're going to do, but we rarely state out how we're going to measure those things and evaluate not just for implementation, are we doing those things, but are they actually getting us what we want? Are we heading in the right direction? So this idea of asking the right questions, and I hate using that word because it sounds really pretentious, uh, but I haven't figured out a better word yet. But what are the problems we're trying to solve? What are the desired outcomes? What are the strategies we can employ to move us towards those outcomes? What do we need to implement our strategies? I cannot stress the importance of capacity. That's why it was in my little market graphic. Uh, especially when I work in weak market communities, but I think it's important for strong and wealthy communities. Uh, if, they, if the community does not have the capacity, not just the tools, but the capabilities to do the work it's trying to do, you're setting it up for failure. And as a planner, I'm always struggling to try and figure out not only to give the community a good plan, but how do I also help the community build the capacity they need to implement their plan? So we can say we want to preserve 20% open space. That's going to cost us $50,000 an acre. But if we don't have the will to actually allocate money in the budget to purchase that open space, we're never going to achieve that goal. So how do we build the capacity to actually do that implementation? I use an open space example, could use an economic development example. I had a community that wanted economic development along a certain state corridor. It was going to cost $1.2 million for a sewer line extension. Three plans, 30 years, three decades, said they needed to invest in the sewer line. They still hadn't invested in the sewer line. Uh, I think now a private developer has actually finally put it in. Uh, so their development was possible with tax abatements back from the community. But the point being is, for 30 years, the community claimed they wanted commercial development and expansion in this area. But even though they claimed that, they were never willing to actually make the investment they needed to make to allow that to happen. So understanding land value signals. Uh, too often I ask planners, you know, so you hire me, you want me to help you with your downtown, and one of the first questions I'm going to ask is, so what are rents in downtown? Oh, uh, not really sure. Uh, I can probably find that out, though. We need to know the value of real estate. The fact is, rents tell us a lot. Sales value tells us a lot. We need to continually monitor the land value signals. Are rents rising? Are rents declining? City of Hartford, a colleague of mine who's a real estate broker, started his career in Hartford in 1980. And Class A office space, when City Place 1 opened up, Class A's office space rent in downtown Hartford was $20 a square foot in 1980. Today, Class A office space in downtown Hartford is about $24 a square foot. From 1980 till today, there has been basically no move. And oh, property taxes have gone from $6 on the 20 to $14 on the 24. Land value signals. 
We have to understand what's going on in the land markets to actually understand the problems that it is we're trying to solve. What should we do as planners? Do not approach land use from an isolation, from social cultural things. Monitor real estate markets. Plan scenarios. There's never just one singular plan. Have multiple plans. Be prepared because the future is unpredictable. If we can't achieve this, what can we achieve? Which direction are we going to go if things don't work out the way we want them to work out? Investigate possible negative consequences of strategies. What are the unforeseen consequences or the foreseen consequences of doing something? And constantly monitor uh, what's going on. Once again, are we getting what we want in Connecticut? We talk about economic development. We talk about growth. We talk about all these things, but the indicators, and I'm just using one, Mark used that graphic of the number of large projects, 24 per year or whatever, in the state of Connecticut. We could have shown that in a graph just like this one, and we'd probably see a similar uh, pattern line formating, uh, formulated here. So are we getting what we want? In the interest of time, I'm going to slip this skip these two slides. Just very quickly here, just the recognition that if I'm working on a development project with a developer, it's not until step seven that you find out about it, <laughs> most often. Uh, that idea of the land use process as a potential barrier to investment, after a year and a half of work and anywhere from 50,000 to 250,000 being spent, to get us to this point, the last thing we want is a denial. And if your regulations are going to say you want industry, but you put them in a special permit and then you deny us, it's really unfair in your time and it's unfair in our time. So economic costs of permitting, two projects I worked on, out of state, Mixed use, $60 million development, $4.2 million budgeted into the pro forma for permitting. Building permit fees alone were $400,000 or equal to four building expect inspectors earning $75K plus $25K in benefits, or 8,000 hours of time. 15% of the return on investment is $9 million. 44.6% of the ROI was tied up in the permit fees, if you want to look at it that way. Connecticut case, 40-unit multifamily development, $70,000 building permit. That 70 k at those numbers above, 75 k and 25 k in benefits, works out to 1,400 staff hours. My point here is we're allowed to charge permitting fees to offset the cost of administering the process. 40-unit multifamily development at 1,400 hours. That means a building official working 75% of their time over the course of the year on that one development. Are those fees reasonable? The zoning permit was an additional 30,000 or 600 hours. And that's not including the permits for the initial site plan approval, the coastal site plan approval, and so forth and so on. Mark talked about, you know, the site selectors want what, 14 days, ideally seven. My client in Louisiana, I was doing some updates on their zoning regs, they had me reviewing their permitting process, they wanted to make sure they were swift, sim simple, and certain uh, in this post-Katrina to attract development. And I'm reviewing their regs and I'm kind of scratching my head here in Connecticut and I call a client, I'm like, when I come in next week, uh, we need to sit down. You've got to run me through your permitting because something's not making sense here. So I get down there, I sit down. I was like, all right, you guys just had that Lowe's store develop. Run me through the permitting process for that Lowe's. And he's kind of looking at me. He's like, developer walks in, drops the permits and plans on the counter, and we review, and in three to five business days, we issue the permits. I was like, okay, stop paying me. It'd be irresponsible for me to recommend a more swift and simple and certain permitting process. But the fact is, this is what we are up against. How long would it take? How long would it have taken in 2004 to get a Lowe's approved if you even got it approved? 
you are talking probably a nine to 12 month process, especially before we constricted the zoning timelines and statute. You are talking probably neighbor opposition, most likely a lawsuit from opposition and a period of time in courts. And in this community, someone walks through the door and it's an administrative review by staff. It's site plan. Does it meet the standards and the regulations? Go through the checklist. Yes, 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 yes. Issue the permit. Even if we did it by site plan, we're still much longer in time. So it's a great article. I think if you Google this, uh, the development review process, I've summarized it. Uh, I think you can find a PDF of it online. But it basically lays out, from a planner's perspective, this idea of creating an effective permitting process, being predictable, fair treatment, accurate and accessible information, timely process, reasonable and fair cost, competent staff, and elegant regulations. And I provide more detail of them on the last slide there. So with that, I will stop and ask you if you have any questions. I've sat in planning and zoning meetings where several commissioners were arguing that this is not a good business idea, they're not going to last for a year, and we should not approve it based on that aspect. Right. I don't think that's our role as government to actually make that determination. Uh, you have an application before you that I would assume is permitted under the regs, however it's permitted. Uh, otherwise, that application wouldn't be before the commission if it wasn't permitted. Uh, and it's not the, per the commission's role to determine what is either a good idea or a financially feasible development. Uh, their role is to determine does it comply with the standards set forth in the zoning regulations. And if so, it should be approved. So Cecilia Hartford just recently re revised their zoning regulations to allow permitting as of right. Have is it too early, or has that had an impact on economic development and, and, and permits that you're aware of? <laughs> I was a resident of Hartford for 17 years. Uh, I just recently moved. Uh, hmm. I haven't been asked these questions in public, so I'm feeling really gun-shy here on answering. <laughs> uh, I, I'm really concerned about the changes Hartford's made to its regulation. Uh, while I know many are very big proponents of the form-based code, I find their new zoning regs to be cumbersome and challenging. I've worked on some projects. Uh, I think they have done a good job in shifting away from the uh, special permit uses towards more site plan, but there's still a lot of discretionary language, I believe, in the site plan approval process. Uh, that as a planner I'd like to see gone. And then last, I'm really concerned about the recent changes in the parking standards. Uh, I was recently involved in a uh, private development developer wanted to acquire a blighted abandoned property that's been used primarily for drug dealing and replace it with a financial institution, essentially a bank. And uh, the new parking standards say that you can have no more than five parking spaces. They set parking maximums. And the bank's going to employ five persons. So there's no parking for customers. Oh, and the regulations prohibit drive throughs uh, The project died. It's not happening. So I, I have concerns, but I think they've, they've made some improvements in some areas. A lot of POCDs have not made um, accommodations because they're a bit older for uh, marijuana dispensaries. Um, do you see that there should be any special considerations for those coming in because it's kind of a new thing? Uh, at the end of the day, from the dispensary standpoint, would, would I, I couldn't oppose a community that decided to make those special permits in the sense that I recognize it's a new use, it's kind of, you know, 
uneasy, these changes in laws related around what was once a fully controlled substance and so forth. So I would fully understand the community doing a uh, special permit use for those. Does it justify being uh, contemplated in the POCD? I'm not sure. I, I think it's just part of your commercial uses. And if you allow pharmacies in your commercial zones, then why wouldn't you allow these facilities? But I could see the need for greater precautions. So. Can I answer that? Huh? Can I answer that? Sure. So in Milltown, what we did, uh, we have it as a use by right. A dispensary is a person. It's a pharmacist. A dispensary facility is where they operate out of. So we are allowing them in certain zones um, as a standalone operation. And we treat it like a, a pharmacy. So it's got to be, the dispensary has to be a licensed dispensary. And then the, uh, the facilities have extreme state regulated access. Now, I've asked around to my economic development <coughs> colleagues who have these. They are not what you think. It's not a bunch of stoners hanging around listening to Jimi Hendrix smoking weed outside the building. All right. It is very tightly controlled one person at a time. They go in, they turn in prescriptions, and then they have to leave. State, the state reg does not allow them to go there and just sit around. They also cannot smoke. In, in public. And primarily, they're buying topicals, the oils, and the like. So it's not what you think it is. It's, it's not like Colorado. My son lives here. I, I, I was just going to say, Tom just described the difference between Connecticut and Colorado. <laughs> no, my, son, my son lives there. And so it, it's a bit of a free-for-all, although where he lives, they don't allow it to be to be uh, smoked uh, publicly, but they're not, they're, they're not buying that much of the plant. It's really more the uh, topical oils and things. So we just, we just passed this. We have gotten bombed the last couple of weeks because the states issued three more uh, licenses. Middletown happened to be the hole in the state. So I've done an awful lot of research. I've fielded calls from all kinds of people from all across the uh, country, uh, and it's coming. I, I have to weigh in on this one. Marijuana, <laughs> marijuana is illegal to possess, sell, or grow by federal law. I do not understand how a state can nullify a federal law. By that logic, the city of Middletown can say, our people don't have to pay income tax to the state of Connecticut because we disagree with it. So telling me that it's quite proper and legal to sell marijuana when federal law says it isn't, can someone please explain to me how that makes sense? I'm going to leave that to an attorney since I'm not an attorney. We'll leave that. Uh, There's lunch outside for all of you leaving. I, I'll just state from, from my perspective, I, I just really boiling down to a use, forget all the legal stuff, I don't see much difference than a pharmacy itself. And a lot of times I just look at uses in the context of what's going on inside the structure and what's the practice here. But I'll leave that to a legal expert, not myself. All right, thank you. Let's give a warm round of applause to our presenters. Our Mark Waterhouse, President, Garnet Consulting, and Dr. Poland, Senior Vice President, Managing Director of Urban Planning for Goldman in York. I'd also like to once again thank our sponsors, Eversource, providing this wonderful space and also providing a, a great lunch and breakfast and plenty of juice. I don't know why, but plenty of orange juice. Uh, but we do hope you stay for the networking lunch. I'd also once again like to thank Kamoyne Associates, Rob Kamoyne is here, and also Pullman and Comley, Michael Andriana. Did I get that right? And he left some great information on the back regarding finance, financial transactions and things of that nature, so take that. And I, I do want to thank Tom Morano and Nita because they are the inspiration 
behind this workshop, and I think it's been a great connection that we've made between NIDA and COST and bringing you all together to have a really interesting discussion about economic development and community planning. So thank you. Thank you.